Hi, Word of Christ. It's great to be with you. Welcome back. We are excited that we've gotten off the ground with our new series on prayer. And we had an awesome start last week where we looked at what is prayer. And if you recall, we define prayer as this two-way relational communication that allows the transfer of something from one party to the other. That, in a nutshell, is what prayer is. This week, we continue on in our second teaching where we look at what the purpose of prayer is. We're so excited to cover this with Ms. Sue this week. Don't forget, stay with us at the other side of this message. I'll be back. We're going to summarize this teaching and leave this with you, some summary points that you can take with you throughout the week. All right, family, we'll see you on the other side. Hello, family, and welcome back to the prayer series, our new series that I'm very excited about, and I know that you, you are as well. And I know that this will be really helpful for us to walk in the things that we have been learning recently in uh, our series on the book of Galatians, because uh, you're going to see how that's related to prayer. Uh, anyways, uh, in the last session, I covered the uh, basics about prayer, uh, which is what actually prayer is. And today I want to move to the purpose of prayer, uh, what the purpose of prayer is. And I'm going to show you that uh, the purpose of prayer, I'm going to say it right from the beginning, is that the will of God may be done. Now, that may be a bit uh, religious, but it's religious only when we don't know what the will of God is. Because the moment you realize what the will of God is, you realize that it's better than what your will could be for you, what your desire could be for you. And we're going to discover this. We're going to go to a couple of places in New Testament and Old Testament and see uh, clearly uh, the purpose of prayer and um, get into the details of this. Anyways, um, so um, in the last session, we looked at uh, the analogy of basically that intelligence that comes into a physical form um, so that that intelligence can animate that physical part, that body uh, of us. Um, and in order, when this is done, basically the will of that intelligence is done in the body. All right. So because your body is nothing but an instrument, a tool for your mind to uh, basically do certain things. Your mind can't do something of its own. It needs a body. It needs your hands. It needs your mouth. It needs your tongue. It's no, it needs your vocal cords. Uh, it needs your feet, your hand to walk, to handle, to speak. All those things are the necessary elements for, uh, and I'm going to say it, the will of your mind to be done. But uh, also I, we looked at this, that it's not really your mind that uh, needs, uh, basically, it's not really your mind that has a desire that must be manifested in your body. It's the spirit that has a will, a desire, and the body becomes basically that instrument through which the spirit does the work. But then uh, mind is the medium between the two. Mind is the place that the spirit uh, communicates with and then your uh, mind communicates with your body as well. So it's the transfer from the spirit to your mind to your body. That's how it works. And the point of prayer was to actually my mind to come to this presence of the spirit while in this body. So that explains to us uh, the analogy of the temple of the body, having a mind inside and having a spirit inside. So within this temple of body, the mind communicates with the spirit and through that, the temple shows basically uh, the will of that spirit. In the Old Testament, it was known as the temple being filled with the glory of God. And that's basically the visibility of God, uh, the features of, not the features, the, the attributes of God to be seen in us. All right. So now I'm going to look at a couple of verses uh, quickly and we come back to this subject. So uh, as I said, we covered these things um, very, very briefly in the last session, but we're going to look at them in detail. So Hebrews chapter 10 uh, speaks of uh, basically Jesus uh, coming to this world and um, quotes a portion of the scripture that is taken from uh, Psalm chapter 40. And I'm going to um, 
read it for you in verse 5 and then we're going to get into the purpose of prayer it says therefore when he came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure then i said behold i have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will O god okay so two uh points one in verse five and one in verse seven in verse five we are told that he said a body you have prepared for me in verse seven we are told that uh, that is to do your will O god so what we are seeing is that the body is needed for the will of god to be done now i know this is uh, to some this may sound very simple to some it may sound like really i mean uh, that is the point of prayer yes again you're in physical form you're living on this earth there is heaven there is earth on earth uh, which is the seen part, the visible part, is where we are communicating with. All the human beings are in this realm. So if you're communicating with someone, you're going to be using words. You're going to be using impressions in your face. You're going to be using your hands to give something. You're going to be using your feet to go places and help people. So therefore, the will of God for basically is, uh, you know, um, in John chapter 6, actually, Jesus clearly says the will of God is life. We're going to get there. But anyways, if God wants life for um, my friend, my co-worker, my family member, if that is the will of God for them to have life, then how is it going to be manifesting through me? Well, it has to be through my body. Even the prayer, even the healings, even those stuff, how do they come? When a word is spoken, when a hand is laid. So our physical part is really important. In fact, the word became flesh. So all that God was came and manifested in a physical part. So the will of God done in the body is the purpose of prayer. I'm going to say it again. The purpose of prayer is that the will of God may be done in body. Now, when I say in the body, I don't necessarily or only mean my body. I mean the physical realm, uh, in the natural realm. All that God desires must, must be seen in this realm. Uh, in fact, there is nothing more than the glory of God to be seen. And the promise of God is that all the earth shall be filled with that glory or the glory of the Lord shall be seen by all flesh the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of his glory so all these promises are there to show that the purpose of, or the will of god is that he will be seen okay now we know that in christ the fullness of god dwells bodily and you are that body that means the fullness of god to be seen in me in other words is also the will of god so now you may say well these are too much well, I'm not asking for that much. I'm asking for just to get over some stuff. Well, now the thing is, all those things that we want to overcome, we're going to get there. We're going to see how to pray. We're going to see what Jesus taught about prayer. We're going to see how people were seeing results in the scriptures. And we're going to see examples from our own personal lives. And I know that you can have those discussions among yourself and your groups about how you have seen this. And these all can help us. But if you remember in the last session, I said the only way that <clears throat> uh, that will of God can be done in the body is when God builds inside of us a king-based uh, king mind. Or I'm going to, let me say, let me use better wording. Uh, if God can make our mind to be a king after God's heart. If God can make my mind to be a king after God's mind, it has both uh, the authority and the power to do it because it's king. And it, because it knows the will of God, it will do the will of God by the authority and power given to him or given to it, whatever, however you want to say it. All right. So that is 
so far, we looked at even Jesus coming to this world, he said, for your will to be done on earth, uh, there was a need for a body. That's why a body was prepared for me. So the spirit descended into a body and through that things began to happen. Now, Jesus often prayed. That's where uh, he came to the, to the realization of uh, how to do this. Or basically, the more he knew the will of God, the more he did it. Now, um, you know the story of uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus goes and prays uh, that, uh, that cup of suffering may be taken away from him, he adds, but yet not my will, but your will be done. See, I'm uh, basically listing all the scriptures for us to realize that it's the will of God that matters. Okay, it's the will of God. Now, <clears throat> uh, again, in order for you to show that this is not a religious saying and this is not something dry, something um, that, oh, okay, so again, I have to do what I don't want, but God wants, and I'm, anyways, I'm going to do it. No, it's not like that. The will of God, that once, when Jesus did uh, what he did, it wasn't out of, um, you know, some sort of sacrifice for God. It was a willing act that he did. Why? Because before doing it, he came to yield his will to God, and God revealed his his will to him and then the will of Jesus became God's will and that began to happen and that was a full of joy kind of experience so I'm going to show you that um, okay let me just do it instead of saying it um, so let's go to uh, the book of Psalm where actually uh, Hebrews 10 comes from uh, let's go to Psalm chapter 40 and uh, look at verse 1. Well, let me just show you that the verse that I quoted uh, just a few minutes ago from Hebrews 10 is uh, here. It was taken from here in verse 6 to 8, and then we go back. So verse 6 says, uh, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. This is amazing. This is not quoted in the New Testament, but I'm going to come back to this. So sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offerings and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God and your law is within my heart. So this is a portion of the scriptures that the writer of uh, the book of Hebrews uh, quoted for us. So what do we have here? I delight to do your will. I delight to do your will. But what comes before that, that my ears you have opened. So let me just put this um, on the screen so we can follow along uh, all right so it says that my ears you have opened okay my ears you have opened but then it says i delight to do your will okay so what are the two components that are mentioned here my ears and your will okay okay my ears you have opened to do what that helps you to uh, hear the will of God. Now, this is the amazing part. If I continue or go back to uh, the beginning of this story, you're going to see what that actually uh, is, that will is, or in what form that is. Uh, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, 
and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps, he has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God, and many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Okay, so let me say this. He says, I was in the miry clay and clay, you know, that God is known to be um, the potter and we are the clay. So, but then what, who was made of clay? It was Adam. It was the first man. It was the natural man. It is who we were apart from the knowledge of Christ. So he says, I was in Adam. And he says, it was like being uh, in a horrible pit. It was like being in the miry clay. It was like your feet to just being um, second after second, uh, drowning into this basically dirt. I was going deeper and deeper and deeper. And then yet I prayed and he said, God inclined his ear. He heard me. He heard me. He brought me up. Not only he brought me up out of that uh, place that was not um, firm to stand. He brought me out of that. But then he, he caused me to stand on a rock. Something that is solid. Something that can't be changed. That's Christ. Okay out of Adam into Christ. Now he says also he established my steps. So he's going even higher. He's growing in this knowledge of Christ. Okay. So that's uh, the picture that we are seeing. And he says, then he put a new song in my mouth, which is praise to our God. Why? Because of the work that was done, because of how he set me free from this uh, first man, the natural man. He has made me to become a spiritual man. And he says, many will fear it and will trust in the Lord. And he says, because of this, because of what was done, and because I'm declaring this, and because many are going to be hearing, they're going to trust in the Lord also. Now, we know that this is, um, after that, uh, it's mentioned that this is actually about Christ. When Jesus came to the world, he said, this is about me. In the volume of the book, it's written of me. I said, I have come to do your will, O God. So now, in a sense... This is speaking about the change that happened uh, from before crucifixion to after resurrection. So Jesus came in the likeness of the man of sin, in the likeness of human beings, in the likeness of the first man, Adam, uh, natural. And then God um, brought him one uh, second after second after that Adam. So he came to a place that he was completely yielded to God. And because of that, then he was raised uh, out of the dead. And that's where the union with God starts. So then he comes to us. Then he sings praise to God. He reveals to us the work that God has done. And then we trust in God because of Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter, um, I think, 1 uh, and 1 Peter chapter 1 also says that through him we believe in God. Why? Because we see the work that is done in Jesus and then Jesus declares that this is what he has done and we're going to trust in God because we have seen it in Christ and then that will be done in our life also. So I just wanted to give you uh, an interpretation of uh, what actually this is talking about. Anyways, let's move on. Verse 4. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Okay, now this is about trust. And does not respect the proud nor such as turn aside to lies. Now, <clears throat> this, if you, if you don't go over these um, verses and you just read one after the other, you don't see the consistency and you don't see the, how basically the Spirit of God is building upon the previous verses. Because here suddenly he goes to uh, lies. Okay, to lies. That means, uh, basically, if you want to look at uh, the previous verses, it's clear was why he's talking about lies. He says, when I was in the horrible pit, that's where the lies were around me. But I trusted the Lord. I trusted the truth that it is his will to take me out of here. And because of that, God took him out of there. I'm going to say it again. He's telling us in verse 4 that blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. It says men who are, 
who trust the Lord, or who, who actually, I mean, this is powerful the way it's written, who make the Lord their trust. These men don't believe the lies that they're told. Now, this is the experience of the one that just a few minutes ago or a few verses before was in the miry clay, in the horrible pit. And he says, I was there, I was surrounded by lies. I was given the opportunity to believe the lies that God is not with me, God has forsaken me, God has left me, and says, yet I, I trusted the Lord. And because of that, he came out. Now he says, I'm a testimony, this is Jesus, I'm a testimony that God does what he says. Now listen to this, verse um, 5. Many, O Lord, I'm, uh, O my God, are your wonderful works which you have done. And your thoughts toward us cannot be counted to you in order. If I would declare, uh, if I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Once again, two things. Verse uh, five says, "Many are your wonderful works," and then he says, "Your thoughts are many as well. Your works, your thoughts." Now, listen to this. What are these two? The works are just what God has done for him which was, I was in the miry clay, in a horrible pit, God brought me out, he set my feet upon a rock, he established my steps, he put a song in my mouth. I'm a brand new person. I was crying out just a minute before, now I'm singing songs. How God did this. This is the work of God. Many are your wonderful works. In prayer, remembrance of many are your works is very important. Why? Because it reminds you of who God is and sets you free from the proud, which is the liar, in the context. Okay, it sets you free from the lies that are around you. So in prayer, by remembering what God has done previously, you are remembering who God is, and that false image of God that was being shaped before your eyes by the lies that you were hearing, suddenly is shattered. And then, what's going to happen the next step happens, which is, he says, many are also your thoughts. Now, what are your thoughts? The thoughts are the thing, the works that are not done yet. Okay, two things once again, works and thoughts. War, works are the things that are done in the past. Thoughts are the works that will be done in future. Okay, so let me just put this on the screen and you will see this. Okay, so now you're talking about uh, works and thoughts. All right, so it says many are your works and many are your thoughts. Uh, so far, uh, I mean, it's clear. Uh, once again, I have to say this because I'm going to jump to verse 6, uh, which uh, I read in the beginning. Um, so works are the things that are done. Thoughts are the things that will be done. But what is the a place of thoughts in the context of Psalm chapter 40? If you keep this in mind, the next verse gives you the answer. Let me read it for you. Verse 6 says, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, my ears you have opened. Wow. <laughs> my ears you have opened for what? To hear these thoughts. Okay. My ears you have opened to hear these thoughts. Okay. So my ears you have opened to hear your thoughts. And when you hear his thoughts, he said that is later, you're gonna see I have come to do your, uh, in fact, let me just use this. I have come to do your will, O God. That means the will also in turn becomes his works, okay? I, I hope it's not complicated. Once again, uh, my ears you have opened 
to hear your thoughts that are your will that in this process will become your works. That means they will be done. Okay. Now, Jesus said, he taught about prayer and he said, this is how you should pray. In fact, let me see. I can bring it up here. Um, yeah. Okay. So look at here. Uh, this is Psalm 40. I delight to do your will, O God. Uh, and I'm going to show you actually the next time, the first time that this your will is used uh, in the New Testament. Even in the Old Testament, there are not many. Uh, let, let me just read verse uh, Psalm 143, verse 10. It says, teach me to do your will, uh, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Now we jump to Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, uh, verse 10 which is the Lord's prayer. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, going back to this picture, I said, my ears are open. I hear the thoughts of God. This is the will of God that becomes his works in my life. And Jesus said, this is how you should pray, that this will be should be done. This will should be done. So that means prayer is where the will of God is done. That's the first thing. That's the purpose of prayer. But the way this is, is done, my ears being opened to hear the thoughts of God, which are actually the will of God. So his will to me is revealed through his thoughts. So I hear his thoughts. How do I hear this? Well, there are different ways that this can happen. You can have an inspiration in a moment and uh, just uh, know it. You can have um, an impression. You can have a dream. You can have just a small, still voice talking to you. You can be reading a scripture and suddenly there is an impression on your heart to come to know about your basically God's will. Now, I'm going to show you that again, because I'm a person of um, going to the roots. Okay, I'm not much toward quick fruits. I'm more toward establishing the tree. Okay, that's how I am. That's how I live. And because of that, there is less effort for me to produce fruits. Although it may seem pleasant to have quick fruits, but then, you know, Fruits are the things that are grown over time. The tree needs to be established, needs to grow, needs to be rooted, needs to get to the water, and then fruit comes. So that kind of life is shown to us in... Um, in fact, let me just quickly show you some scriptures uh, on the screen. Um, so uh, I have actually um, done a search in the New Testament to find uh, the word will and show you the most important ones quickly so you can see what this since we are talking about the purpose of prayer and the will of God to be done what is this will of God um, and you see how this is connected even to some of the stuff that I taught in the last uh, week's message so Colossians chapter 1 he says for this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will. See how this is important to come to the knowledge of God's will. And he says, <clears throat> this is going to be in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So he says, the will of God is something that only the spiritual, spiritually minded can grasp. Okay, because it's something beyond the flesh. It speaks of the will of God, will of God that shall be done in the flesh, in, in the natural, in the body. But the, the understanding of that for the mind is something spiritual. So he says, in, this is going to be through a transference of the wisdom of God and the understanding of God to my mind. Okay, last week again, I said prayer is where there is a transference of the will of God to me and that will shows him itself in the form of spiritual knowledge spiritual understanding spiritual wisdom okay so um, that's one um, and let me just quickly go to Ephesians look at Ephesians uh, Ephesians chapter 1 
Oh, actually, go can go to verse nine, maybe. Uh, well, look at just <laughs> uh, all the three examples in the book of Ephesians, chapter one. This is amazing. Uh, verse one, verse five says, "Having predestined us unto adoption of uh, children." which is basically adoption as sons or sonship, having predestined us to sonship by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. There you go, the will of God. Okay, That you may be son, that you may be awakened to sonship, that you may be a full manifested son. That is the good pleasure of his will. So that's why I said this is not a religious saying. This is for me to be separated from lies, uh, concerning who God is and his desire for me. This is about God's true will and desire for me. So this is like God is going to the root again. He's saying sonship and with sonship comes a package. So I said in prayer, what's going to happen is my inside is going to be built up. My inner man is going to be built up. God is making my mind and my heart a priest and a king, given authority and power and in the flesh that will be done. So many of the things that I desire to be done in my life is going to be by me being established in the truth of God's will and then what by being built up into that um, king inside, uh, my words will have weight. They can accomplish things. I will be after the image of God. I will speak and things will happen. Okay, We're going to get to the practicality of that as well. Uh, so let's go to verse 9. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. See, the, God's will was a mystery. It's not anymore. Okay? Uh, it's being revealed. There is a revelation of the will of God. How? In Christ Jesus. Who is Christ Jesus? The Son of God. In fact, verse 5 said, He has predestined us unto sonship by Jesus Christ himself. Why? Because Jesus Christ is the will of God manifested. And he shows every will and desire that God has for sons. And he said, the father loves the son in John chapter 5. And he shows him all things. So uh, let me quickly go because I'm already beyond my time limit. Ephesians 1 uh, verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Not only sonship, but inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance. Okay, See, that, that's why we're saying there are things that are being given to us, but it's a bad manifestation of those things. So I need to be con convinced within myself. I need to have a heart and a mind that is built, that is confident, and doesn't listen to lies. Remember Psalm chapter um, 40. Even being in, the, uh, in a horrible pit, you still won't be moved by that and you will be brought out. You will have your feet established and your steps established on a rock and you're moving up and up and up. That's where Christ is. Okay. And you, you, you live from that. You live from that place. Uh, there is so much about the will of God, but I need to go quickly to uh, the last one that I wanted to mention. Uh, okay, so let's look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and 21. Listen, he says, Now uh, the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect, make you perfect in every good work to do His will. Okay, see how many times you're seeing this? Working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the God of peace, he says, do this. He says, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Why the blood of everlasting covenant? Because Hebrews chapter 10, which talks about your will be done, he says, by that will, he has perfected us once forever. By that will, he has perfected us. By that will, that will that Jesus came to do. He says, he has perfected us once forever. 
So the will of God was our perfection. And this perfection means sonship. Perfection means you to grow up and see yourself the way you were designed, the way you were created. And it says, uh, the blood of everlasting covenant. What is the point of the blood of the everlasting covenant? Well, Hebrews chapter 10 before uh, the will of God speaks of the Old Testament priesthood and worshipers who had consciences that were constantly defiled and all they could remember in the presence of God was their lack, their inability known as sin, their distorted image, instead of remembering God. And because of that, they would separate themselves from God instead of coming boldly to God, instead of standing in His presence and knowing that God has given them that place to stand in. So anyways, here uh, we're looking at the uh, purpose of prayer, which is to uh, have the will of God be done. And he says, this is going to be through the kingdom of God. That means he's going to make you a king to do the will of God. Okay, so we are, we are looking at uh, a relationship between father and children and father making his thoughts, which is his will, known to them, us. And the way that they are, they are going to have this is by their ears being opened which ear the spiritual ear which means the ears will be open to the spirit not to the flesh so they're gonna see the beauty of what God says and he what he has done remember your works and your thoughts so I would encourage you in your times of prayer do this I mean two simple steps uh, remember God's works by declaring it to him say say that uh, or do this uh, with thankfulness. In fact, I think it's in uh, 1 Thessalonians that Paul says, giving thanks to him in all things, which is God's will for you. Uh, and you never give thanks to God or anyone uh, if something is not done. So thankfulness is for the things that are done. Okay. Uh, so now let me just come back to my thoughts. Um, okay. In prayer, by remembering the works that God has done in Christ Jesus and even in your own life. Um, let your, your heart and mind come to a place of being free from the lies that God is something else. So even in uh, Hebrews 13, it said, Now the God of peace who brought us our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. See, again, the works remembers. Then he says, make you perfect in good works. That's because he knows the thoughts of God for your life. So do this in prayer. Remember his works and then let that bring you up to speed to be where you're supposed to be. Uh, if there was a time that there was something done and you were supposed to at least stand there, but you came down back to the horrible pit by declaring those works, come back to the same level and now hear the thoughts of God. Now open your ears, declare yourself, you know, you can start by saying, thank you, Lord. Uh, I'm so happy because uh, I see myself free. I was at a time I wasn't. I was struggling with certain things. I, was, I didn't know who I was. I was uh, having a crisis in my life. My mind was going to different direction. My heart was not established. But, but now I have come to a place that I can, I can be sure about you because I can see Jesus and Jesus gives me a firm belief in who you are. I can see everything that was done in Christ is your will for me. Thank you. I remember that. I know this is who you are. I don't listen to the lies and I know that there are good thought, thoughts uh, for me and I know that these thoughts are many that can be counted. So I'm open here to you and I'm going to be opening myself to you. I'm yielding my ears to you and I'm saying that my ears belong to you. L use my ears, open them and give me your thoughts. I want to know your will. I want to know what is this good pleasure of your will? What is this mystery of your will? Just open it to me and let me hear it because I want to live this life. Now I ask, Father, according to your good pleasure, uh, anything that pertains to life and godliness that has been given to me, help me to walk in them. You said everything that has been given to me. It's like um, a talent that is being uh, placed 
uh, in a pianist that he just needs to know some knowledge and after that everything is going to be just uh, effortless. He doesn't need to work for it. He doesn't need to struggle for it. He needs. He doesn't need to uh, go through the stuff that other people are going through. It's just natural. So you have given me everything that pertains to life and godliness and help me to now walk in them. Give me the knowledge of your, um, the mystery of your will. So once you do this, guess what's going to happen? Your inside is being built up. You realize by thankfulness, you are actually receiving the things that God has given to you. You're having a mind that is being trained in godliness. You're having a heart that is being trained to believe. So there is the more you do this, the more repetition that you, this, you do this, that becomes a habit for your mind and your heart. The same mind and heart that previously were trained by other things repeatedly and they were programmed that way. Now I'm changing them. Now my mind is becoming more strong, basically stronger and my words are having more weight. And when I say things, there is more weight and things are going to happen. And that's the way to live. The will of God to be done. All right. Bless you guys. I hope this was helpful. We're going to see you in the next uh, week's message. Welcome back, family. What a powerful teaching. Thank you, Masood, for covering this with us as we looked at closely what the purpose of prayer is. Let's quickly get into the summary points. The first point is this, is that the purpose of prayer is for the Father's will to be done in this physical realm. And so this is really the core of the message this week. And so what we saw here is that our mind can do nothing of its own. It needs your body. And as my sister said, it needs your hands, your mouth, your feet, your voice in order to express its will. And so your mind will carry the intent of your spirit and your mind expresses that intent through your physical body. And so your spirit has a will, something that it desires, and that's made known to your mind. And when your mind is in sync and lockstep with your spirit, it puts your body in motion to carry out and express that will. And this is exactly how prayer works. Prayer brings your mind into, the, into your spirit. Remember how we talked about that we come into our prayer closet and we focus and we close out the distractions of the world, hearing the voice of God, understanding his thoughts. Prayer quiets the outside so you can have that relational two-way communication with God. And then when you leave the place of prayer, your mind can now direct you so that you can carry out the will of the Father here in this physical world. Let's move on to the second point. Remembering the works of God in prayer centers our mind on the truth of the goodness of God. And so we read this um, in Psalms chapter 40, verse 5 and 6, which is the original scripture that Jesus quotes. And it said, Bless is the man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to the lies. Many, O Lord my God, are your wondrous works which you have done. And so bringing the faithfulness of God to the forefront of our consciousness keeps the truth of his goodness before us. You are conscious of it, which means you are aware of it. And so I have some homework for you this week, and that is to read Psalm 77. If you don't read the whole chapter, just read the first 15 verses, 1 through 15. And I'm just going to pull a little bit here for our summary. It says, you'll see the psalmist will say, you know, will the Lord cast off forever? And will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased? Has his promise failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut down his tender mercies? And then he reaches later in the chapter and he says, but I will remember. I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders. I meditate on all your work and I will speak of your deeds. Man, that's powerful. This is exactly how Jesus modeled for us to pray when he said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That word hallow, it means to render, to acknowledge. And what are you acknowledging? You're acknowledging the sanctity of his name and that, yes, indeed, his faithfulness is true. And so remembering the works of God in prayer centers our mind on the goodness of God. And here's the thing to know. When you don't know what to pray, when everything in you is saying that you're tired, this is silly, I don't feel like praying, start by simply remembering. Start by acknowledging. 
just as Jesus taught us to start the prayer. Your spirit will respond from there. Let's move on to the third point. It's this, is that his works are the things that have already been done, and his thoughts are the things that are to come. And so this is really cool. When we read this in Psalms, when you remember his works, you are speaking of what he has already done. And as we read in Psalm 77, it says, I will remember the works of the Lord. I meditate on your work. I will speak of your deeds. That's the stuff that the Lord has already done. His thoughts are what he wants to do. That's what he desires. And it's what he's thinking about. And as the psalmist says, there are more that can be counted. And so immediately after he says that, he says, you did not desire sacrifice, but my ears you have open. And so look, there's this flow of revelation that's coming to the psalmist. And he's saying that you have more thoughts toward me than I can count. And I recognize that it's not the sacrifice that you want, but you have opened my ears so I can understand your thoughts, which hold your will. So when we open our ears and consider his thoughts, we are hearing his will, what he wants. And we see this in the model of prayer again that Jesus gave us. He exemplifies prayer as a method by which his kingdom comes and his will is done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. So when we pray, we remember his works as the things that he has already done, and our ears are open to his thoughts for things that are to come, which are his will. The fourth point is this, is that the will of God is understood in the spirit so it may be so it can come about in the physical world. Okay, and so what we're saying here is it doesn't work in reverse. So we don't experience something in the physical to then try to interpret what the will of God is. That's a mistake that we made. But rather, the will of God is understood in the Spirit. And this is what we saw in Colossians 1.9. It says, We also, since the day heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So we pray that we may be filled with the knowledge of His will. It's not a drip of knowledge. It says that we may be filled with this knowledge. If we are filled with it, then there's no room for anything else. There's no room for the lies, as the psalmist said. So if our mind is filled with what he wants, his will comes to be here on earth, just as it happens in heaven. And then my fifth and final point is this, is that Jesus Christ is the will of God manifest. We saw this in Ephesians 1, verse 5, and we saw it in Ephesians uh, uh, 1 verse 9 again, where we read that he has made known to us the mystery of his will, which is this mystery of sonship. Everything that we see in the person of Jesus is the will of God fully expressed. And so we can summarize and look and see how these things connect. We understand the mystery of the will of God is to have us as sons. That's what we read in Ephesians 1 5. In prayer, we hear his thoughts. And through prayer, his will is done here on earth. And if those things are true, then we also understand that through prayer, we are made to manifest his sonship here on earth. Man, that's powerful. So if you think that through, that's exactly how Jesus looked like. And it's exactly how he lived here on earth. Well, family, we hope that blessed you here in understanding the purpose of prayer. And it's to see the Father's will be done. And that happens when we are transformed from the inside out. It's nothing that happens externally. It's what happens on the inside out. When he does that, we, our minds are aligned to his will. We see it. We see our sonship and our heirship. And we begin to live that out and express it. So his kingdom, it comes. And so his will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. All right, family, we love you. We're so excited to continue on on this teaching of prayer. It feels like we're building momentum here, and that feels awesome. We'll see you next week. God bless you.